a minute or two, Nick says, so I'll give it a minute. So excited to be back here with all of you to talk about this new COVID relief package. On behalf of the partners at Boy and Berenshire and our COVID-19 team, we want to welcome each and every one of you. And thank you for taking time out of your Saturday. I know timing wise, trying to get all of our schedules together, Saturday worked the best. So again, we appreciate that so much. The American Rescue Plan Act was the most recent that passed this week. And I know I was glad to only see 628 pages, but Chris was chomping at the bit and actually read the first one that came out before the changes. So he got up into the uh, thousands again of pages to read, but I luckily we're glad to have him because he loves to do that. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Nick again. He's gonna be our MC and go through some of our agenda and housekeeping items. And then we'll go through what is in this bill and how does it affect you? Thanks, Nick. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. Um, as I'm sure most of you have heard before, uh, we do have a Q&A at the bottom, or well, and at the end, obviously, uh, but please feel free to submit some questions throughout the presentation. And at the bottom of your Zoom, normally at the bottom, uh, there is a button where you can type in questions and you should be able to see other uh, attendees' questions. And if you have a very similar one, take a quick read through those and you can thumbs up one of the other questions and that'll just push it to the top to make sure that uh, we get to it. But this webinar is being recorded like all of our other ones and should be up uh, probably by tomorrow on our website and YouTube. Um, outside of that, I think we will just get right into the agenda. Thanks, Nick. And with us here today, we have our MC, Nick, who you, most of you have been on these and know all of us. And then we have Randy Feld and Tiffany Shermack are out of our audit department. And then Chris Wittick, Nick Swedberg, Barb Soddy, and myself, I'm Stacy Sharp, part of our business advisory services. Normally it's been Chris and I going through the agenda, but today we get to add the MC both during the agenda and at the end. I'm gonna go over all things PPP again, go over the changes, talk about the EI deal advance, talk about that stimulus check, everyone's talking about that $1,400. And then we're gonna bring Nick back in. He's gonna go over this restaurant grant and talk through the details on that. And then he's gonna kick it over to Chris who will finish through the last items and kind of tell you what should you do, what should you do next if you're an individual or a business. And then always make sure we have the Q&A at the end. So with that, we'll get right into the PPP loans. So on this one, the bill itself just talked about expanded eligibility for certain nonprofit organizations. And then as I read through it, I had to put it on here because it made me chuckle a little bit, the internet publishing organizations. It's always so interesting what gets added and changed and updated. So that's really more of a fun fact, at least for me. I don't know if any of you are involved in something like that or know someone. If so, please do let them know. Currently, we are scheduled to close March 31st. For some of you trying to get applications through, you might be working with your bank with earlier deadlines than that. Maybe some are saying March 15th, March 20th, March 25th. You're probably getting a little bit scared and stressed out. Are you gonna get PPP2 or not? Good news is there's a new bill that we hope will pass soon that's in the Congress that's going to extend this PPP second draw, or I guess you can get PPP1 yet if you haven't gotten the first, two months. So we just have to wait to hear on that. Hopefully it'll be signed next week, which will then open up that window of application time. So again, if you're in that phase right now with your business, do know it should get opened up a couple more months. And so you don't have to stress too much over that. And then for some of you, there may have been a window when you could not apply at all. That window's back opened up. So that's the last bullet point is just to say everyone can apply again. And the biggest thing for any of you that are on here that do your business tax filings as a Schedule C as a business, big news for you. The loan amount before was based on your net income. So obviously if that business ended up at a loss, you were not able to get anything. They got that changed. It's now based on your gross income, which would be the sales that you have less than any, any of your cost of sales versus the net income line. So that's been big. I know we've been trying to reach out to our Schedule C clients as we're able to make sure we help with PPP one or two. And in this case, it's not just, it doesn't limit you to that if you have other employees, you actually just get to add the amount to what you can get for PPP based on your employee count. 
and then include this gross income number. So any questions you have specific to that, do let us know because we're not really going into the detail of how you apply for that. The PPP2 loan necessity certification, we've been talking about that. What does it mean? How do we know we're going to be okay? They had that first round saying if you were uh, under a million dollars, you were certifying that you needed it. Well, now they're saying if you have that 25% reduction, you have met that in good faith. So that took a little pressure off all of us, which was nice. There are still many funds available. So it's not going to run out. You, know, you don't have to be stressed that you can't find all the documents you need right now and get it done. They put a lot more money into it again with this new bill. So breathe, take a deep breath, right? Again, it's like the first time around. This time we know more and I just don't want you to stress out over it. The forgiveness piece. A lot of you have asked, should we apply for forgiveness? And again, it will depend on what you have going on based on PPP1, PPP2, now this new restaurant grant, the ERTC. So do still ask and we can give you guidance on that. But also I wanted you to note that some banks still are not accepting forgiveness applications. So it's really not necessarily up to the SBA, but each bank is going to have specific dates that they're going to let you apply for forgiveness. But remember, you have 10 months from the end of the use of your funds. So another thing you don't need to be too worried about yet. Did I freeze? Oh, there. Sorry, you guys. My internet's not the best down here in Lakeville. So if I froze, we're going to have Chris, or if I freeze again, Chris will jump in to make sure he helps. So now I want to go into the EIDL Advance. What this program was, was right away the SBA put out, oh, shoot, the PPP money's not getting out fast enough. Let's do this $10,000 advance for every company. And then they ran out of money and said, okay, only $1,000 per employee. Well, they funded that again with another 15 billion. So if you were a business that didn't get that full $10,000, what they're gonna try to do is reach out to businesses who didn't get the full amount by sending an email. So watch your email and ask if you need the additional amount. So let's say you have three employees, you got 3,000. If they don't run out of funds and get enough money, you will see an email that says, you were shorted on your $10,000 advance. Are you interested in getting the other 7,000? So just make sure you're watching your email for that. But again, the funding could run out. So it's just something to be aware of, but not something that's a sure thing. And then there's a program, if you have less than 10 employees or had a 50% decline in gross receipts, again, they're supposed to be contacting you, but if this is your business, you can reach out and we can get you in contact with the SBA so you can be proactive on it. And that's just an additional targeted advance of $5,000 that you'd be eligible for. And then the same thing on the additional funds and this targeted EIDL, that the tax exempt treatment for federal is the same as the original one, but for those of us in various states, it could still be taxable at a state level. So just be aware of that. Now, stimulus checks. Boy, this is the one that's got everybody all excited or worked up one way or the other. Getting the money, you're excited. Those maybe that aren't or are getting it and don't need it, it's got a lot of feelings to it, that's for sure. And it's a big number, right? This $1,400 per adult and all dependence on your return. So if you have yourself and spouse and four kids on your return and two are in college and two are still in you know, junior high and high school, it's all dependence this time. That was not a typo on our part. So it could be a big, big difference to your family getting this check this time around. What they're planning to do is the first advance payment is supposed to be made this spring and deposits could be as fast as Wednesday. What they're going to do is base it on your 2019 return if your 2020 return hasn't been filed yet. But if you did file 2020, it's gonna be based on that. And then the second advance where they kind of shore it up based on the two years returns will be in the fall sometime, they think. And that'll be 
the, based on the 2020 returns that get filed between now, today, and then 90 days after the individual deadline. And that is also up for discussion at the federal level. They're wondering if that needs to be extended now that this bill passed, but again, we'll be paying attention to that and keep you updated. So what we wanted you all to know, there really isn't an incentive to rush to get your 2020 return filed if your income's higher than 19. So you want to watch for that, be aware of it. If some of you do your return on your own, just make sure you're paying attention to what that income number is but there would be the incentive to extend this year's return, the 2020 return, if your 2020 income is lower. So you'll be able to get that second advance in the fall. So lots of things to think about and worry about, just like with everything else. We're gonna run through some examples for you just to give you an idea of how it works. And sorry, must be have an internet being slow again. There it came for me now. Okay, so um, on these stimulus checks, we've got a couple different examples of how this is going to work. There's a very, very tight phase out range. So between 150 and 160 for joint, you're going to go from getting all of the stimulus to getting none of the stimulus. So our example here, couple with three kids and 140 of income, they get the full thing, which is gonna be seven grand. If you have that same situation with 160 of income, you're gonna get zero. So, you know, that is a very, very harsh phase out. Um, and so you really, if you're anywhere near those phase out ranges, you really, um, want to look at if there's anything else you can do to just dip under that, something like an IRA contribution. Um, the payback on that could really be tremendous. Um, so, and, you know, the second example here is the single person with 75, they get the 1400 and just 2000 more income, 2,500 more income, and they lose $700 of their stimulus. They lose half their stimulus because they're halfway through that phase out range. So, you know, really can be some harsh examples of how these stimulus checks end up working. Um, so if you're anywhere near those thresholds or limits, you really wanna pay close attention um, and be very careful. See if there's anything you can do to, to dip underneath. Um, so the, the next example here gets into sort of the timing. So married couple with two kids on 150,000 of 2019 income, they're gonna get a stimulus check of 5,600, but their 2020 income is higher. So they really do need to wait to file their 2020 return uh, until after you get the first stimulus check. If they already filed 2020, they're gonna get zero because in this situation, their 2020 income was too high and you're just gonna get stuck. So you're gonna get penalized by the timing of when you file your return. Nothing good comes from filing your return before you get the stimulus. And in some situations, good things will occur if you delay because then you could get like the partial stimulus. Um, so our, our second example here, their 2019 income was high and you know they have conformity reasons or unemployment reasons or PPP reasons that they're not gonna be able to file their 2020 return until this summer sometime. So that's okay. If you file your 2020 return this summer, you can still get the stimulus in the fall. There's basically gonna be two big payments of this. One, they'll pay in the spring and those deposits are already teed up to, to begin next week. And then if you don't get it then, but you file your 2020 return, which has lower income on it, you will be able to get this in the fall. So you haven't lost out on the opportunity. And then of course, um, you'll be able to once again, recalculate the entire stimulus when you file your 2020 return. 
So if you miss it based on the 19 return, you got a chance to get it with your 2020 return. And if you miss it on your 2020 return and your 2019 return, you then have the chance to catch it with your 2021 return next year. So you got a couple of opportunities uh, to get after this. So I know we'll probably be more questions about the stimulus. Uh, it's a big, big ticket item. But for now, let's turn it over to Nick and talk about these restaurant grants, which are uh, crazy big if you're in the <laughs> restaurant industry. Yeah, speaking of another big pot of money, um, and it's actually a very misleading name. The restaurant grants are not just for restaurants. Uh, they worded it so that it's uh, for any business where the public assembles for the primary purpose of being served food or drink. So it opened up to a lot of different industries, actually. Um, here's just a very quick sample of what they listed in the bill. Uh, they had a few others in there that I liked. They had saloons in there, which is fantastic. Um, but then restaurants, tap rooms, uh, breweries, brew pubs, all that. Uh, everybody falls into this. So the tax treatment's very similar to the PPP. That's why we're kind of calling it a PPP round three. It's tax exempt um, at the federal level. We don't know about the state yet. And uh, we are allowed to deduct what we spend that money on. So it's great news for all of us. And there's a maximum of $10 million and 5 million per location. Uh, so if you have three units, you can apply at all of them, uh, just so they're gonna cap you at 10 million uh, between all of them. Um, but then on the next slide, you'll see There we go. Sorry about that. The calculation of it. Um, this one is actually a little easier than the PPP rounds have been. This one, you don't really have to go get too many forms out. Just get your income statement. We're going to look at the 2019 sales and compare it to 2020. And whatever that drop is, is the initial gap there we're working with. Obviously, if you were uh, blessed to not have a big drop, uh, you uh, already got booted out. But what they're going to do is start with that drop of income and then take out PPP round one and two. And then if there's anything left over, they're gonna give you a grant for that additional amount. Uh, there's a few little uh, qualifications. You can't have over 20 locations, can't be publicly owned. Uh, you had to be open by January 1st of 2020. There are actual potential grants for people that did open in 2020 or who are opening right now. Those are just, uh, different calculations and very limited circumstances. So I'm not gonna go into that here, but happy to talk about it later. And uh, that grant, uh, we don't actually know the application process yet, but we are hoping that we'll find out here very soon. And on the qualifications, um, sorry, on the um, certifications, there we go. Uh, we do still have to say that there is current economic conditions that make the grant request necessary to support the ongoing operations. Um, this is super similar to what they wrote on the PPP rounds. And obviously if you are a restaurant in Minnesota, we're still under restriction. Um, we're getting some nice weather, which is very uh, promising, but obviously that is Minnesota and it might not last all that long. Uh, so you just, uh, just like the other ones, make sure that you can make that certification before you go for this restaurant grant. And uh, the first 21 days are uh, targeted. So they're going to be prioritizing uh, women-owned, veteran-owned, and socially or economically disadvantaged small businesses. We don't exactly know what the prioritizing means. Um, I don't, we don't think it means that they're not going to look at others. It's just if uh, those groups come in, they probably pop to the top of the list, but they're still going to be hitting these pretty quickly um, once we figure out where exactly we are applying for them. Uh, one good thing just to get ready is make sure to have, uh, like I mentioned, you get your income statement ready for 2020, 2019, have the calculation done so you know exactly how much you're going for. Because uh, then with this grant, the qualifying use of funds is actually the most uh, lenient of all the loans that we've seen. Uh, it's It can be used on payroll, mortgage, rent, uh, maintenance, uh, PPE, uh, certain uh, construction costs for outdoor seating, uh, probably not, you know, to add a big expansion, but if it's related to outdoor, it might fall under that. It does say construction to accommodate outdoor seating. So uh, we think that's being pretty generous. Uh, and then they added two things at the bottom that said operational expenses and any other expenses the administrator determines to be essential. 
honestly, it sounds like they just want to pay for all your business expenses uh, and not to mention food and beverage. Uh, so it's all your cost of goods sold, all your labor and kind of everything else is how this reads. They really just want you to spend this in the business and spend it on just normal operating expenses that you would have if you were fully open and uh, pre 2020, kind of how you used to run. And uh, hopefully there should be no problem spending the money. Uh, but uh, if you didn't, this is the one kind of other pivot from the PPP is instead of it turning into a loan like you could do with the PPP money, uh, anything not spent here uh, has to be returned. Uh, but also they didn't put the payroll restriction in here. There was no percentage uh, balancing you had to do. They really just want you to spend the money in the restaurant, brewery, brew pub, uh, food truck, or saloon. Uh, and then they're going to be happy. Uh, we don't know the proof that they're going to ask for at the end, but uh, for now it's just run the business like that's your cash in the bank once you can find it. So we're gonna run through two really quick examples. So this one is uh, used to be a million dollar restaurant back in pre-COVID times. And in 2020, they dropped down to 550. So the initial potential gap is $450,000 because that was our decline in revenue. And this restaurant got a PPP round one and got the increased PPP round two. And so we have to subtract those off the 450. The next one, again, calling it PPP round three, would be $210,000. Uh, there are also, uh, the nice plug on the bottom, and we'll get into it in depth later on, is that there's a big opportunity for the employee retention credit, and it has to be balanced. Uh, the ERC has to be calculated and balanced along with PPP round one, two, and three, and there's a lot of complexity there. We'll get into it a little bit later, but we just can't double dip, which is fine. Uh, this restaurant grant's gonna still be better than any ERC. And the ERC will just be a bonus on top, basically. Uh, so this next one, bigger restaurant, 2.5, dropped down to 1.8. Uh, so about a $700,000, or exactly, a $700,000 decline. Their PPP round one and two, though, together was over 700,000. Uh, so since we had a negative number, uh, it's a zero. No qualifying for the restaurant grant. This is a great example of somebody who very, very likely will qualify for some major ERC credits, which again, will get into and try to help quantify in a later slide. And I think I get to pass off now over to Chris again. Yes. Yes, so one of the big things in this new bill was unemployment. And this is one of the things they argued about and they changed uh, several times as I was reading all these various versions. Um, and so this is where they ended up settling. They ended up settling on additional federal unemployment benefits of 300 per week. And that's going to go from March 14th through September 6th. So, you know, March 14th, that is, uh, that is tomorrow. There's a reason they passed this bill uh, just this week, because that was sort of their deadline when the unemployment benefits were going to expire. That was their motivation to on the on the timing. So they've also sort of added this 29 weeks. They've changed from 50 to 79 weeks is the federal portion. So that all aligns. So it's 300 per week uh, for anyone claiming unemployment. And then one of the last things they ended up sticking in there was that the for 2020 some of the unemployment can be income tax free. So normally unemployment is taxable, just like wages are taxable, just like interest is taxable, everything else. Um, but what they've decided to do is that for 2020, a portion of the unemployment benefits will be income tax free for the IRS. So it's $10,200. And the way they wrote this was I think very strange and very unusual. And so one, it's retroactive to 2020. And so we're not really sure what you're supposed to do if you already filed your return. Uh, at the moment, the IRS is requesting people not file amended returns, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, so this is maybe, you know, maybe if you've already filed your return, but like if you have employees who, we're on unemployment for a period of time with your business 
and you know sometimes they like to file their returns early uh, you might want to just give them a heads up about this so there's a very hard cap on this tax-free unemployment and this part is also i would say extremely unusual and it sort of aligns with the stimulus so there's a hard cap of 150,000. And so they're saying, if your AGI for 2020 is 149, then both the taxpayer and the spouse could exclude up to $10,200 of unemployment if both were having unemployment benefits. And if you're at 151, you get zero tax-free unemployment. So that's a very, very hard cap and a, a very unusual way uh, that that works. Another unusual item about this is that it's a hard cap at 150, regardless of your filing status. So like all the rest of these things, it's the phase outs at 200 joint, 100 single. It's at 150 joint and then 75 single. So they're adjusting for sort of single or separate and it's always half as much. This time that's not the case. So a joint return with 160,000 of AGI, but there was some unemployment there. If you filed separately, and so one tax, the taxpayer had you know 90 of income and the spouse had 70, then each of them separately is under the 150,000 threshold and they can get the tax-free unemployment. So that's very, very unusual. And you really wanna keep an eye on that if you know, maybe your spouse had unemployment, but combined you're over the 150, especially if you're close to it, you might wanna look at what is the benefit of filing separately. So you can get that $10,000 exclusion. So, the, I mean, the last bullet point on here also is important to note. This is, again, a federal change that's retroactive. That does not apply to the states. Some states are maybe going to take up a similar cause. And I know in Minnesota, they're, they're thinking about it. There is a bill that's in, in the legislature right now. It's unclear if it will pass, um, but they're looking at also retroactively uh, allowing some of that unemployment income to be tax-free. So I would say there's still some um, sort of state issues to be worked out on this, but some highly unusual rules about tax-free unemployment uh, that are really, you know, could make a significant difference in your tax situation uh, especially looking at whether or not you should file separately or just if you can, again, sort of manage to dip under that AGI limit with like an IRA contribution or something like that, because it's such a hard cap, which again, is just a very strange, uh, very strange situation. So as we, as we move on from the unemployment, um, we get into a whole bunch of individual tax items. So I'm grouping these all together as the low income credits. Um, but as you'll see, you know, they do apply to some sort of higher income or what you think of as higher income uh, threshold. So the child tax credit is the first one greatly expanded. This one's for 2021. So they've changed it to be fully refundable. They've raised the age from 16 to 17. They've added a new um, sort of threshold for kids ages sort of zero to five. They get more. You get more for a child that's two years old than you do for one that's 12. So that's different. It wasn't like that before. And here's where the phase out range um, for the extra more portions, they start at 75 and 150. But the phase up for the original child tax credit remains at 200 and 400. So we end up with two different phase out ranges for the one child tax credit. 
Um, you know, I don't think anyone here is probably preparing their income tax return by hand, uh, but this is very unusual and very complicated. There are two phase outs for just the one credit calculation, which is now up to $3,600 per child for the, you know, ages zero to five. And now it's 3,000 for kids six to 17 years old. And this is only the beginning of the complication for this child tax credit. There is also a provision in here that the child tax credit can and will be paid by the IRS in advance for 2021 only. And so the way this is gonna work is the IRS is supposed to develop some kind of system to handle this and now it sounds like it's going to start in July. So it's unclear if you would be getting 1 12th every month or if you'd, I guess, be getting 2 twelfths. We'll have to see what happens. But I think starting in July through December of 2021, the IRS is going to attempt to pay out the child tax credit in advance. They're also going to have this portal where taxpayers can go in and adjust it in some fashion or decline to take it in advance, um, I'm, I'm skeptical the IRS is gonna handle this well. They have their hands full with a lot of stuff. Um, something like this where they mail monthly checks to millions of people and have a brand new online portal uh, to capture a concept that has never existed before. Um, I mean, there's even complex rules about how you calculate the advance and the reconcile this on your 2021 returns. This is gonna be a hot mess, I think. Um, so we'll see what happens, but you know, at least in theory, you're gonna take this new credit and then like split it in half and then pay out half of it in advance. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be an adventure this year for sure. The earned income tax credit is uh, sort of the most traditional low income credit. Uh, big, big changes for that. They've changed the maximum age. There is no maximum age for 2021. So this is sort of aimed at perhaps uh, older folks, elderly folks who may have gotten back into the workforce um, and have a little bit of earned income. They've also changed some of the rules when you're a, a full-time student or if you have children. In general, the credit amount has doubled and they've also dramatically increase the investment income that you're allowed to have. So before the threshold for this was very low, now it's up to 10,000, which I think is helpful. And I think it's really gonna help those older folks who maybe went back and started working, they're more likely to have some investment income um, than say a, a 25 year old would have. So um, they've also in, sort of increased this look back rule that we've talked about before. You can now use your 2019 earned income on both your 2020 and your 2021 years if you, if you choose, if that works out better for you. The dependent care credit, otherwise known as the daycare credit, that's become fully refundable and this is dramatically increased. So the amount of um, it qualified expenses that you can claim has more than doubled for each child, the credit amount is dramatically increased and the phase out, perhaps even more importantly, the phase out is dramatically increased. So we went from a 35% credit before, now it can be 50%. The phase out, you know, it started at 15 grand before, now it starts at 125 grand. So I got a couple examples here of how this can work. And, you know, I think the point is it's dramatically different. So a joint couple with two kids, they had 20 grand of expenses for these two kids, 300 grand of income. The old way, they were gonna get $1,200. The new credit is $8,000. So dramatically higher uh, daycare credit. So if we look at this in conjunction with the child tax credit, we got a couple more examples here. Um, the first example, we got married with two kids that are young, they're ages three and five, you've got the daycare expense. So what were you getting before? You were getting 4,000 child tax credit, 
1200 daycare credit. What are you getting now? You're getting 7,200 child tax credit and 8,000 of daycare credit, and it's fully refundable. So, I mean, that's $10,000 more in credits in this situation. 10,000 on income of 125. I mean, that's, that's a huge, huge number. You know, another example here, if you had lower income and, you know, maybe your business lost money in 2020, you're married with two kids, you have 50,000 of income, 10K of daycare expense. So not even that much daycare expense. The old rules, you would have gotten about 2,800 of child tax credit because it was not fully refundable. You would have gotten zero daycare credit because your tax liability already would have been zero. What are you gonna get now? You're gonna get 7,200 child tax credit plus 5,000 daycare credit, fully refundable. You know, you have 50,000 of income and you're gonna end up with like an additional $9,000 of tax credits in this situation. So, you know, I mean, it's a little extreme. We've got the two young kids, we got the daycare expense, but you know, these are dramatic changes if your income is low in 2021. And so big, big changes um, and, you know, a, a tremendous opportunity for those who end up having lower income uh, this year. So shifting away from the individual uh, tax provisions, those individual credits, we've got the employee sick leave credit. Originally, it was 10 days um, and you couldn't double dip, but it was only through the end of the year. Now it's been extended now twice. First, it got extended to the first quarter. Now it's being extended further. They're also changing it so that, you know, people are getting vaccines now. If you get sick or if you're out to get your vaccination, you know, sometimes people are getting a little bit sick the next day. Um, that type of sick leave is also now covered. It's not just having COVID, it's, you know, maybe recovering uh, from the vaccination. It resets the 10 days. Uh, important to note here, this is also available for the self-employed individuals. The family sick leave credit is sort of the corollary to this. So they've again increased, expanded it a little bit. So now we went from a 10 grand max to 12 grand. So there's gonna be sort of 10 extra days is being added. Again, the definition has changed a little bit. And uh, once again, the point is these can be available for self-employed people. The way it works is you take your net earnings from self-employment sort of divided by 260. Uh, that goes into this calculation. So if you are a sole proprietor and you're out and you're not able to work, um, this sick leave credit or the family sick leave credit is still available to you. It is not just for employees. Something that is for the employees is the employee retention credit. Um, sometimes I refer to this as ERTC. Sometimes I say ERC. It's a hard habit to break. Uh, so forgive me, I will call it probably both of these in the next five minutes. Um, so we keep talking about this. Um, because this is super, super important. And we really see this as a massive opportunity for clients uh, in, in, the, in the coming year. So the reason this is a massive change is that back in late December, the new rules allowed you to do both the PPP and the ERC, and you could do it retroactively for 2020. So the 2020 rules are gonna be different than the 2021 rules. Um, you know, I don't know if it's super important that you can dive into all of the nuances and we certainly will not get into all of them here, but just note the 2020 rules are a little bit different than the 2021 rules. You know, big picture 2020, the maximum you can get is 5,000 per employee in 2020. It's a 50% credit. 10,000 of wages counts. And the business itself needs to qualify. There are three big ways you can qualify. 
So the first one there, you'll see the gross receipts is down 50% comparing year over year. That's a very black and white calculation. We can look at your income statement and determine whether or not you meet that test. That is the test you would love to start with because it is black and white. The answer is obvious. The second way you qualify is that your business was totally shut down and you were paying people. So, you know, again, that's pretty black and white. That's pretty obvious. If you were entirely shut down, you, you can easily identify which days those were where the government uh, shut your business down entirely. Lots of people maybe don't have a lot of payroll then. So it's an easy test um, because it's black and white, but you probably don't have a ton of wages if you were totally shut down. Some do, um, but for the most part, not a ton. The big opportunity is in the third area, which is not black and white. It is sort of the gray area. And we're, we finally started to get some rules on this. So the big bill passed last week and it really said nothing about ERC. But I think it was, maybe it was 10 days ago now, we got a hundred pages of guidance on the ERC. And so that really answered a ton of our questions about ERC. Technically it was not in the bill that got signed yesterday but it did come out in the last 10 days or so. And so we wanna, we wanna talk about some of those. Partially suspended business operations is really the key area. And now we have some better guidance about how that's supposed to work. And we also started to get some guidance around what happens with my PPP forgiveness? How do I allocate? So as Nick was talking about with a restaurant grant, there's no double dipping. You know, there's no double dipping applies to basically everything we've talked about and how they may intersect. And this is a key, key issue for the employee retention credit is I can't use wages for PPP forgiveness and ERC. But what, how, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to figure this out? And so the guidance we got that hundred pages essentially said, I think there were, you know, there were two key takeaways. One, if you already filed your forgiveness application for the first draw, you cannot amend it. You cannot change it. You're stuck with the choices you made. So that was uh, disappointing, I would say, uh, for sure for those businesses that may be applied with only payroll costs because they thought it would save them time and, and effort. In hindsight, uh, you're gonna regret that. So that, that was a disappointing piece of news. That was a key question. The other key question was sort of how do you allocate this stuff? And the answer basically came out that you can pick and choose. Picking and choosing is fabulous news. You will end up with more credit if you can pick and choose. The problem is that if you can pick and choose, there is an endless number of possibilities for how this can go down. So I sort of look at it like this is a calculus problem. And now there are almost an infinite number of solutions for it. And you want to find the one that maximizes everything. You want to find the one that maximizes the PPP forgiveness and also the ERC at the same time. And the ability to pick and choose is gonna mean that your ERC will be more, but it also means that this is like a Calc 4 problem and not a Calc 1 problem anymore. Um, it, got, it got more complicated, but the end result is that you should get more if you know what you're doing. You know, you start this whole calculation by going through a chart like this, which I understand is probably very small on your screen. You can download it. Um, on our website, but um, you go through this and you do this quarter by quarter. And, you know, we've gone through some of these examples before, but you go through it quarter by quarter and then you determine when the business qualifies and then you get into employee by employee for this ERC and you start to do these calculations. In 2021, the rules are different, as I said, 
And I think the key takeaways here, it's allowed for larger businesses. And then the credit amount, you can max out at 7,000 per employee per quarter. And the part that was in the bill uh, yesterday was that all four quarters of 2021 are now fair game. So, you know, in theory, if your business is down in the dumps, you're down 20%, you can in theory get the ERC all four quarters of 2021. And the maximum is 7,000 per employee per quarter. That's 28 grand per employee. That's a massive number. You know, my hope is that your business is not down 20%. Uh, I think you'd be better off if business got back to normal in the third and fourth quarter. So that's my hope is that third and fourth quarter, we don't have a lot of clients qualifying, but if you are still under some government uh, partial shutdown orders or your gross receipts are down 20% because for whatever reason, the sort of the demand has dried up for your type of business, you know, it's, it's good news that this ERC is going to be available and it's going to be a maximum of 7,000 per employee per quarter for the entire year. There's no double dipping. I mean, we're back to sort of, this is again, like a Calc 4 problem. You're starting with this to figure out quarter by quarter, does the business qualify? Again, this is a different chart than the 2021. And this time we're figuring you know, do you have PPP2? Do you have the restaurant grant? Um, and you can't double dip on any of those. The, the sick leave credit, you can't double dip with that. And that just got extended. So uh, there's really you know, a lot of moving parts here. Uh, and the calculus problem is, is probably just as difficult for 2021 in most situations as it was for 2020. It's better because you could get it every quarter but that also means you have to do the calculation every quarter. So, you know, with every piece of good news that comes more complexity. So you gotta sort of take the good with the bad on this. Um, couple examples, we've, we've been through these before. So, you know, that's a high, high level overview of the ERC. We've spent an incredible amount of time uh, reading about this. You know, we could do, I could do an eight hour probably webinar on the ERC and not cover all of it. Um, I guess my advice would be be very careful and make sure you're maximizing the ERC and the PPP at the same time. You don't want to claim a bunch of ERC and then spite sort of end up screwing yourself over on the forgiveness application. Uh, as Nick was saying, the PPP is still better. The PPP is $1 of benefit if you follow the rules, the ERC is 50 cents of benefit or 70 cents of benefit if you follow the rules. So you wanna make sure you're getting the PPP squared away and then address the ERC with the leftover. And the good news is you can pick and choose. So there's the potential for more leftover wages to be there. So we wanted to go through um, you know, a few more ideas and some of these have changed uh, on you know, how do you think about when you file your 2020 return, how you actually do it, you know, get the returns ready for possible extension. I think extensions are going to be way, way more common than they've ever been before. You know, in a lot of situations, you're going to want to wait for the SBA forgiveness before you submit your 2020 return. You're going to probably want to um, record that forgiveness on your 2020 return in many situations for basis. You know, the law is still a little bit unclear, but if you have basis or any ownership changes, uh, you really want to look at recording it in 2020. I'm, we're expecting huge delays. The IRS is way behind still from last year. And now they're redoing everything to allow for tax exempt unemployment and sort of run that through their system. And then there's going to be a ton of paper filed amended payroll tax returns to claim ERC. You know, most of those will be this summer. They're doing stimulus checks. They're creating this portal for your advanced child tax credit. You know, the IRS is, is a hot mess right now. And it's, it's 
maybe going to take a long time to get paper checks. It's going to take a long time to get amended returns. So just, just accept that the, it's going to take a long time to get anything back from the IRS. For individuals, we got these stimulus checks going. I think those first direct deposits are happening on Wednesday. Uh, if you had direct deposit on your 2019 return, you know, how long is it going to take them to mail out checks? We're not really sure. Um, but, you know, just keep it in mind. You don't want to rush filing your 2020 return. As we've talked about, there's stimulus, there's conformity, there's PPP, there's unemployment reasons. All of those are reasons to delay filing your 2020. Um, be sure you're aware that you can look back at your 2019 to maybe use that income for some of these low income credits, especially if you're like a Schedule C that lost money this year. And again, you know, huge delays dealing with the IRS with anything. For businesses, if you experienced a quarter that was down 25%, you know, you strongly want to consider looking at the PPP second drop. As we said, it's scheduled to close March 31st. I think there's a very good chance now that they extend it for two additional months, uh, but you wanna be looking at that in case it doesn't get extended. We've got EIDL loans. We've sort of stopped talking about those, but if your business is improved and you got one of those EIDL loans, you really need to read all of the rules and regulations about that. There's a lot of stipulations. I think in many situations, we're gonna see businesses pay back their EIDL loans this year. It's a 30 year loan, but with all the restrictions on it, I think it, it makes sense to pay it back. So you're free of the restrictions. Remember, keep an eye on your ERC when you're doing PPP first draw forgiveness, when you're doing PPP second draw forgiveness. You wanna be using non-payroll costs on your PPP forgiveness so that you have more wages left over for ERC. The more wages you have left over for this calculus problem that is ERC, the more ERC you will get. For the restaurants, you know, if you're a restaurant and you haven't talked to Nick, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, you really need to monitor the process for these new grants and talk to Nick. He is the expert on this. Um, but it'll, it remains to be seen sort of when that opens and what the process will be. And if, you're, you know, if your business was down, if you got closed at all, if your supply chain got uh, interrupted, if you were prohibited from doing some types of business activities, you got to look at the ERC. Massive numbers and it can be done retroactively. So, you know, the way it works with PPP, I think the, the ideal timing in most situations is going to be wait for the second draw period to be over. So your 24 weeks will be over in maybe July, maybe August. Uh, and that's really when you wanna do these ERC studies so that you're maximizing both the PPP forgiveness and also your ERC. Planning out the use of the funds, the restaurant grant funds are great because you can use them on a lot of different things. Tax planning. Tax planning is gonna be wildly, wildly important. We've got a lot of these things that are tax free, tax exempt in terms of the PPP, but like the sick leave credit is essentially taxable. The ERC is taxable. So you're gonna have big tax free items running through your 2021 return, but you're also gonna have big taxable items running through there. I think we can get some, some weird situations. And so tax planning, you know, incredibly important uh, for 2021, as a lot of these big ticket items make their way through your business tax return. So we're here to help. Uh, if, if you need us, we can help with the forgiveness application consulting, forgiveness application preparation if you need, consulting services for those over 1 million. You know, I think most of those still have not submitted their forgiveness applications. So we're, we're still working with a bunch of them because they're going to be audited by the SBA. Um, we can help you with the second draw application. You know, in many situations, it is very similar uh, to the first draw, but, you know, we've got those qualifications. You're going to need to document their gross receipts are down. 
when your 24 weeks is over, and I keep saying 24 weeks because, you know, I think in 98% of the situations, 24 weeks makes the most sense. The point is to capture as much non-payroll cost as you can. And if you choose a 10 week or 11 week or 17 week period, you're not gonna have as much non-payroll cost. So most of the time we're seeing people really benefit from using a 24 week covered period for both the first and the second draw. And then, you know, the big ones are gonna be employee retention credit calculations, both for 2020 and for each quarter of 2021 and tax planning. You know, those are really, I think, gonna be the two huge ticket items um, that are really gonna make a difference in uh, the cash flow for a business. With that, I think we've reached about the end of our hour. So let's see if there are any questions that we can answer live. Yes, so we do have a good amount um, of questions that we have kind of kept up on and answered as we went, uh, which we might circle back to if we need some additional uh, questions or if it kind of applies to the whole group. Uh, just one very interesting note, we did have uh, an attendee that already got the stimulus in their bank last night. So though uh, they are flying out, that is amazing that that um, already came. So thank you for letting us know that. Um, real quick, I'll just hit the restaurant one that I wanted to cover. Uh, the restaurant grant, which again is much more than just restaurants, but that's what they called it in the bill. Uh, whenever that uh, actually opens up, we're not positive, uh, but you have until the end of this year to spend that. Uh, they were, they set a date of 1231, 2021. So this one also is a little bit longer. Um, and somewhat piggybacking that, when we're talking about how you can't double dip uh, on, you know, restaurant grant or PPP round two with the ERC or the uh, FFCRA or any all these different acronyms and credits we're using the question came of how do you make sure that you're not reporting too much payroll or using your payroll on the forgiveness application and I think Chris kind of touched on it but just to reiterate uh, just filling up the non-payroll buckets as much as possible on your forgiveness forgiveness applications is key because uh, it doesn't, if you list all the payroll, because they do ask for that, uh, like the person says, they ask for the payroll cost. So you list that and then you list all the non-payroll costs you can. The SBA in their 100 pages, pages of guidance did tell us that uh, just because we listed it doesn't mean we're tainting the whole number. It's just how much we used uh, to balance out that 60-40 non-payroll payroll cost. Uh, and then for the restaurant grant, it doesn't seem like we have to claim any of it on payroll. We might need it uh, depending on the dollar value, of course, uh, but for that we can fill it up. It sounds like with everything else, which is kind of amazing. And if we're still under any restrictions uh, from the governor or wherever, uh, we could potentially qualify for round or Q3 um, and Q4, like Chris said. Not that, not that we're hoping that we do, but it definitely is possible. Um, oh, and another really quick one, just because it ties in perfectly with that. If you do qualify for the restaurant grant, uh, it doesn't mean you should ignore the ERC. Uh, definitely because of that last thing I was mentioning that the restaurant grant let us spend it on everything. Food, liquor, it sounds like insurance, uh, supplies, PPE, uh, just everything you can think of. But and uh, outdoor seating expansions, it seems like, are going to qualify. So there's so much that's going to qualify for that restaurant grant spending that I think we should still have some ERC potential for pretty much every restaurant that I've been running through um, an example like that. Chris, you have thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. There should be ERC. And then we get back to this notion of like picking and choosing. So, you know, for uh, the manager at the restaurant that makes uh, 80 grand, we can use 10 grand for the ERC that quarter, and we can use some of the wages for the restaurant grant. And, you know, the hope is you're, you're using it on food and you're using it on your rent and your, or your mortgage payment. I mean, it's principal and interest on your mortgage payment. So I, the picking and choosing really does free up um, endless possibilities. And the more possibilities there are, that just means we'll be able to find the best possibility. Um, and so, 
you know, I, you definitely want to still take a look at the ERC um, because, you know, knock on wood, hopefully you don't qualify third and fourth quarter because business is good. But if you think about it, if business is good, then all of those other costs go up. Your food cost goes up, your wages go up anyways. And hopefully you'll be able to use it all um, on those things. So you're still left with substantial ERC. That is, I think, very realistic. Yep, I agree. A uh, quick question while you're up here, Chris, is on the PPP forgiveness right now, obviously we're not positive what, what is happening with the taxability at the state level. Um, does that affect any of our opinion on when it should be placed? Should it be in 2020? Do we have to do it in 2021 if we haven't applied yet? Um, can you just go into that a tiny bit more on when it's recognized? Yeah, so I mean, I think you have a choice. Um, again, you know, choices are good, but it means you got to think about it. Um, you, you have a choice. You could put it in 2021 if you want. You can, I think you can put it in 2020. I think we've seen a lot of situations where people for federal reasons need it in 2020 so that they can claim a loss or they need it in 2020 so that their distributions are not taxed. And so, you know, it, it, there are pluses and minuses. Um, I think extensions are tremendous. I, I see no downside to extensions. Um, so you could even extend and then make up your mind later. You know, you could file the extension now or in April for your individual. You know, you don't need to decide whether or not you're putting it on your 2020 or 2021 return until you actually file. So the hope is the conformity issues will work themselves out. Um, many states have already addressed this. Minnesota, uh, you know, more than a little slow to address this. Uh, they're working on it, and hopefully they'll they'll get to it soon. I remain skeptical, but we'll see. Uh, but a lot of other states have already addressed this, so you know it, it really depends on the basis. It really depends on the ownership situation. There can be real incentive to get it in 2020 if there are any kind of ownership changes. So every situation is a little bit different, but I do think you know it's within the realm of possibility that either one is is a choice if the forgiveness was granted in 2021. Oh, yeah, great clarifier that if they applied in 2020 and it was forgiven in 20, it's, it's obviously 20. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, can we use the restaurant grant money to pay back rent and bills? Oh, I guess that's sort of kind of for me, but uh, just to also see if anybody else heard anything. I didn't see anything in the bill that specifically said it couldn't, it had to be, Yep, in so this certain time period, it sounded like, honestly, expenses to keep you open. open. Yeah, thank you, Stace. Open. Yeah, it, there was no qualifier uh, in that section. They really just want you to use it in your restaurant to stay open. And I would argue, especially if it's back rent, you've got to pay that to stay open. And that uh, seems like it would count. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, another great question on the PPP round two with the restaurant grant, uh, you do not need to have the PPP round two in order to get the grant. Uh, really, if you didn't apply for PPP round two, depending on when the grant money comes out, you maybe just wait. Uh, it's kind of very specific to your circumstance because the restaurant grant money is uh, much more flexible and can uh, leave more ERC potential for us and has a longer spend. And uh, if you get to PPP two, it'll just reduce your restaurant grant. So if you can hold off, it might actually be beneficial to hold yeah, off if you can. I think there's a little risk there. Like, yeah, very true. If you were sure that you could get the restaurant grant, you would be better off getting the restaurant grant than the PPP too. Mm -hmm. um, because the terms are, they're just better. They just are. They're similar, but they're better. And, you know, there's 20, I think it was 28 billion or so in the restaurant fund. Is that gonna run out? I don't know, uh, maybe. What happens if it runs out and they start limiting it? Uh, I don't know. So I think there's a little risk. Um, and I also think, seems like most of our restaurants have already gotten the second drop, but you know, it just depends on your situation and how much of a difference that could make in your ERC. But you know, it's, it's a tough call to make. 
Yeah, definitely tough. And we don't know if the application for the restaurant grant is going to be out fast enough. Obviously, we have PVP round two uh, available for another couple of weeks. Um, so you can hold up a little bit, but probably good to make a decision here pretty quick on which one you're going to do or both. Um, uh, for payroll, another different question from someone is on the payroll costs, they're open, but down more than enough to apply and get PPP round two, like we saw with a lot of different people. Uh, what payroll costs do we look at to determine the employee's income? Uh, sorry, I got a little sidetracked on when they say subsidize. I'm not sure if we're looking at ERC or just PPP round two. Um, I think trying to answer your question, and I'm happy to do a clarifying one if you want to follow up. Uh, PPP round two was able to pick. You could either go with 2019 like you did the first round, or you could actually use 2020 numbers uh, to come up with how much uh, your loan was. Uh, if you're in the restaurant area, the NAICS code for restaurants, the 72. Uh, you actually got a little bit extra, um, but sorry if I just missed the point of the question. Feel free to pop in another clarifying one and then we can jump on that. A uh, quick one for you, Chris. Um, the, with the EIDL advance, is there anything we need to do to know if that's forgiven, forgivable, anything uh, on our end that we have to do? Nope. It's forgiven. Done. Period. I have I have one thing on that. Can I, am I coming through clear enough? Yeah. That's my internet. Yeah. Okay. So the EIDL advance, we had, I did have a good question. I should have said answer live. Can people that didn't apply early on go and apply now? No, unless you have under 10 employees and had a 50% reduction in your revenue. So for everybody else, it was kind of a one-time shot, but now this time around, they're going back to make the initial people whole or help those that are under 10 employees with a 50% reduction. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and a great question um, on the restaurant grant that just came in is, will the grant applications go through banks? <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not know. I wish they would, because uh, that process seemed to go much better uh, than ones that had to go through uh, some other institutions we dealt with on some other grants. And that was really tough to get in line uh, it was silent on that. Uh, it just says the administrator, uh, which refers to the SBA, uh, which could technically go either way. Our current feeling is that it will be through the SBA, uh, potentially on their website, kind of like the original idle loans that were going out. You went and applied online. The website crashed every about 20 minutes and you just had every laptop you own in front of you trying to get connected and try to complete the application on one of them. Um, but it's a little bit of a, we'll find out here probably next, late next week. Uh, but currently we're thinking it's going to go through SBA. And we've also talked to several bankers who uh, are kind of leaning the same way. It doesn't sound like it's going to go through them, but uh, nobody really knows. Yeah, there's no fee for the bank. Great point. So they seem unlikely to jump in there and help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shocking. We'll, we'll see. Maybe they'll change it and there will be a fee or something, but. Yeah, maybe. I would guess it's direct through the SBA, just like the EIDL loans. So. And so Stacy obviously is so annoyed that she didn't get to talk for her normal slot of time. She's clicking that she wants to answer everything as soon as you ask it. So um, uh, stay, uh, great one from uh, Mary. Do we need to provide evidence uh, that the EIDL 10K is forgiven? Is there any paperwork we get on that? So this is a good question because what it's going to affect is PPP1 that applied for forgiveness and the bank said you owe that 10,000. You do will get squared up with the SBA. So you're going to need to provide two SBA letters to your tax preparer. They'll need the first PPP loan that got forgiven and then the second round of the 10,000. But other than that, if you didn't get PPP, it's just make sure on your financials it specifically states EIDL advance as other income. We then as your tax preparers know that is not taxable on the federal return, but we add it back unfortunately at this point to the Minnesota return as income. And then is the, again, can we go back and get the advance if we didn't apply the first time? We can't unless that under 10 employees and the 50% reduction, the SBA is supposedly going to be reaching out so you could be proactive and call the SBA, but anyone who doesn't fit those parameters, there's no opportunity to apply again. 
the forgiveness letter being part of the PPP loan forgiveness. It is, it's all part of the PPP loan. So for those that got the PPP loan and have not applied for forgiveness, you no longer have to put that $10,000 advance on there. So you'll get the full amount forgiven and not have that $10,000 advance as taxable income. Again, but only on the federal return, not on the state. Right. All right. Well, I think that is pretty much it. Um, and yeah, one specific one, it looks like Stacy's jumping on. Uh, so I think that's about all we will do today. Uh, thank you for, uh, wow, almost everybody hung on that whole time. That is fantastic. That was a lot of information. I know all of these turn into being a lot of information. So just know that for specific stuff, uh, we'd love to help. This is the team that uh, you've seen most of us before, and we're always uh, very happy to talk about this stuff. Uh, obviously, we're living and breathing it right now, uh, even a little more than we like probably, but we've read this thing several times. And if we don't know the exact answer, we have a very cool team here that can help out. And Stace and Chris, you just wanna say bye. Yeah, thank you again, everybody for being with us. We appreciate you all joining us on this nice Saturday, at least here in Minnesota. So reach out with questions and thanks Nick and Chris for your assistance. You bet. I'm heading out to a restaurant patio right now. Good. Too nice. Bye everybody. Bye everybody.